Okay, here for the weekend pod with Daniel. How are you doing, sir? I am not so bad, thank you. How are you? How was your How was your week? Yeah, well, we were just saying off air, mixed bag. I was up in the mountains with uh, 49, 11 year olds, uh, which was, let's say, challenging and very tiring. So it was a, a kind of um, a nature center on a beautiful lake in the Olympic Mountains. So it was magnificent, uh, that part of it. And then there was um, a really horrible incident where one kid smacked another kid over the head with a large stick which i had to witness um so that was not is that the absence of guns yeah well that's what happens when you ban pan guns nra on this yeah <laughs> we we should arm 11 year olds and they'd all protect each other it was uh it was horrible i have to say thankfully i think touch words uh the uh, kid in question is going to be all right Made it back to watch the football today, which was... Uh, I wish someone had whacked me over the head with a stick at about 4.25. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I saw the... So, two things to talk about today. We've got the women winning the FA Cup, which was which was great. Uh, fantastic performance. Uh, we'll get to that. And we've got uh, United losing to Arsenal. The men's team losing to Arsenal very narrowly uh, in a completely different style of play. Um, which was interesting. So, I mean, what do you want to start with first, men or women? I mean, I think the point that like really occurred to me about this game that feels mind-boggling and yet believable yet unbelievable. How can you possibly have United women playing an FA Cup final at two thirty, and then the men play Arsenal at four thirty? Yeah, yeah, it's horrendous. Scheduling. What happens if that goes to extra time? I, I understand it's different television channels, but there has to be some level of joined-up thinking here, and it has to be a situation where the women's cup final is understood as something that is special, but the men, the men's game. So that, so that this doesn't happen. Yeah. And maybe, maybe there's a reason that I don't know about. So I don't want to totally gob off about this because I'm not, there might be something I don't know. But on the face of it, it's, it's a piss take of the fans that care about both and want to watch both. But more than that, it's that the men's game has a duty to look after and support the women's game. And this is not that or yeah. anything proximate to that. In fact, it's the reverse. Yeah, no, I fully agree. And clearly this could have been thought about long ahead of time that a scenario like this would have happened. Whoever made the women's final, it should be special and sand on its own. Uh, I do think I, I do think that's wrong with the FA and the Premier League not to coordinate on that. And it also forced United's leadership into a decision where they split who was going to what. So the women got Avram Glazer, lucky them, uh, and the men got Jim Ratcliffe. Now, I think it may be true, at least someone was saying, that Ratcliffe is meeting Burnham and Keir Starmer after today's game to talk about uh, Old Trafford regeneration and stuff like that. So that may give him an out. But um, if, if it was a choice between the two, clearly the new leader should have gone to the big game that actually meant something, which was the Women's Cup final, not a dead rubber United versus Arsenal, which didn't mean anything, at least not for United. And also, Joel Glazer, or uh, whichever could say Avram or Joel. Rat face fucker Avram, Avram, yeah. Yeah, so Av Avram Glazer. Like, let's remember that the Glazers only allowed a women's team when it basically became impossible for them yeah. not to. Yeah. They, they, they cancelled it in the first this. place, remember? First thing they yes. did. They don't care about this. And them, yeah, just them going to that game, just even that like, makes me feel slightly poorly. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I was I was I was on shift today, so I, I I didn't see all of the game, but it felt like it felt like the news that, and it maybe it's the same for Ten Hag actually. There was a bit of a sense of if if the United lose that game, Mark Skinner's got a massive problem hanging on to his job. I mean, clearly, absolutely, and and uh, I don't think manager's job should be based on one game. I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all, and doesn't seem like the kind of holistic thinking that the NES team want to bring in. Anyway, um, I mean, it does seem that their efforts have been focused on structural stuff on the men's side of the game first, and we haven't heard much about their plans for the women's team at all. And uh, and and yeah, I, I think the better look would have been Sir Jim going to the women's FA Cup final, and no one would have given a flying fuck except some gammons on Twitter um, had he not attended the, the the match at Arsenal. But you know, there you go. Um, uh, there's the look. There's plenty of work to do with the women's team. They've had a very poor season all in all, except for this cup run. I mean, they've, they've finished fifth in the WSL behind Liverpool. They've gone backwards quite severely. 
They had some injuries. They did this trolley dash at the end of the last summer window and got a load of players, most of whom haven't really worked out. Um, but, 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 fantastic performance against Spurs today. Um, you know, Ella Toon going around to Spurs player. player and banging into the top corner. The, 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 you know, t- talking about cancelling the women's team, she was at United as a kid, had to go to Blackburn and then to City. Uh, in order to make it as a professional, because there wasn't a professional Manchester United women's team, uh, and then was brought back by uh, Casey Stoney. And yeah, what a player! And very fitting that she scored that goal uh, to get United moving today. And it's you know, absolutely, absolutely brilliant, bang into the top corner. And not not for the first time, Everton scores in a massive game. And you've got to give credit to Skinner as well. Actually, he made some pretty big calls for the team. Yeah. He left out Nikita Paris. Um, he left out uh, Gaze, uh, Gaze yeah. as well, and. Play Mallard up front instead, yeah. And yeah, yeah. they won 4 0. I mean, there was a point where it felt like, oh, this could this could get pretty embarrassing for Tottenham. Because yeah, yeah. it's 4 0 with 20 minutes to go. And it didn't work out like that. The question now is where they go from here, because if you look at Chelsea, I think we can probably assume same as Liverpool, Emma Hayes leaves, it doesn't matter who comes in, they're gonna be less good. City so gonna be better. I think we can probably assume Arsenal are going to be better as well because they've had some horrific luck with injuries. Yeah. Um, they've been without Beth Mead, they've yeah, been yeah. without uh, Vivian Miedemar, um, been out there with Imsen, and that's just off the top of my head. I, I, it's, it doesn't it doesn't end there. Yeah. And they they will be much better again next season. And behind United, as you, as you mentioned, Liverpool are improving, Tottenham are improving. So it's great that they've won the Cup, but they need to, they need to build on it. And as you say, we've no idea whether Big Uncle Sir Jim is going to allow that. Well, we don't. And and there isn't a real structure in place at the moment. So there's an interim director of football um, above Mark Skinner, who came from the foundation. Polly Graham Bancroft left to take all over at Grimsby as CEO. Um, so they need to make changes there. I mean, we've seen some really aggressive moves, like uh, for CEO, director of football, technical director, um, uh, all coming in at United, what well, we assume Ashworth will get done eventually. Um, so big changes on the, the men's side of the game. I don't know how much Ashworth will be across the structure on the women's side too. I mean, Barada clearly is, um, but some work to do there and some work to do on the team there. There's weaknesses in the team. Plus a few players out of contract, including Mary Earps. Uh, and, yeah. and so we may be in the situation where one of the United's best players leaves on a free again, because it's happened quite a lot recently. I mean, I guess they sort of knew that might happen because she probably wanted to go last summer, really, yeah. and, and didn't. And if you're her, I hate to say it, but why, if, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, it depends on her options, of course, because I, I think City, Chelsea and, and Arsenal all stocked up with keepers. So um, the story going around midweek that Nikita Paris had turned down a massive contract offer from the NWSL to move over to the States uh, in order to finish the season. Uh, with United, uh, kind of um, sad irony from her that she didn't get into the starting team, uh, given that she turned down that move. But uh, we'll see whether she stays. She said, "I mean, she scored quite a few goals this season, so I guess it's a good season." But didn't that- she's one of those players who always felt like had ability, but was someone going to be able to unlock it to the point where she, because she has ability to play at the top level, but. Was someone going to add whatever it was was missing that was going to turn her into a player who was actually good enough to be a starter in one of the best teams? And she probably isn't quite there. Yeah, she's someone who is a is your first reserve forward is great to have, but if she's someone you're relying on to help you challenge for the title, probably not quite good enough. I would say. Yeah, I think that's completely fair. Uh, and, and well, we'll see. I mean, Skinner, there was talk about him being offered a new contract. I don't think that's been signed. Uh, I don't know whether a cup final win should really make a difference about that. I, I guess there's some thinking to do for the club overall. But look, fantastic moment for the club. You see how much it meant to the team. Ella Toon lifting the trophy. It's fitting that it's her. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's a great... Was it not Katie Zellem who did? Oh, was did it? she not take the trophy? Oh, uh, yeah, maybe it was. So obviously yeah, cut yeah. this, but I, yeah, I don't yeah. think it was her. I think it was Zellem did it. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, but yeah, great celebrations afterwards. Uh, great crowd at Wembley as well, uh, although there were some complaints 
from United fans that the way the tickets were distributed, the you know the four thousand or so that turn up at Lee Sports Village every week trekking out there, uh, didn't get first dibs on the seats, and the FA were like did it on a more general sale basis. So I think there were there was some unhappiness about that, but still great crowds. You know, Wembley basically full, uh, nearly full anyway, um, and and a great moment for the club overall. Yeah, hundred hundred percent. It's just whether they're prepared to go on from here or not. Yeah, and I've said it on the pod before. It's actually the easiest part of the club to fix in a way, because the finances involved in in uh, taking that team further forward are not that great. Right? There's more money in the women's game, but also plenty of opportunities to, to sort of cross sponsor effectively from the club overall, um, and so the the level of lift needed to make the women's team highly competitive with the sort of big three um, is much less than it is for the men's team, uh, which is a bit of a mess. All right. Let's move on to United Arsenal, uh, which was uh, which is weird as fuck, wasn't it? Because Ten Hag did, at least my feeling is, if United had taken that approach this season, which is to be much more conservative or normal, structurally defensive, Lee, which is you know a player sitting in front of the back four to protect, and the and the the full backs, uh, you know, getting covered most of the time by attacking players. We'd have had maybe ten more points this season, I think, maybe even more than that. Um, and it's interesting that uh, with uh, Sir Jim watching, uh, Ten Hag has pulled out a performance to not get embarrassingly beat after last weekend's or last Monday's performance against Palace. Yeah, I, I I was thinking about this, and it was because like, I was thinking, what if everyone was available? Then what? Because obviously Bruno has to play, and it was partly the absence of Bruno that forced him to do that. Partly also getting gubbed with Crystal Palace, yeah. partly playing Arsenal, who are better than that. So how do you actually go about doing that? If because what you just stick Casemiro and Maine, you just stay there. Is that is that what it is? And because we we do need to find a way because there's a potentially humiliating FA Cup final not that far away. Yeah, I and I don't know what the answer for that is exactly. I mean, today, because Amrabat played, he just sat there. And I, I don't think he's very good and 10 million. I think that's also because he doesn't know how to move. He, he doesn't know how to move. Yeah, that's right. I mean, but he just sat there and took the ball off the back of the defence. And it didn't it didn't really help United with the build up because they just went quick and wide as always. Right. So the, the United's build up play wasn't any different, different than against a very, very good defensive side, like the, the best defensive side in the top five Euro leagues. United barely created a thing. But what they did do was not allow that open transition like too often. Like it happened a couple of times in the first half where Mainu pressed high as he's kind of expected to join the high press. Uh, but with because Amrabat doesn't move, you know, he got caught out less often. Obviously the goal came from Casemiro not holding the line, which is the absolute basics. They even teach you under fives that. I'm, I'm not even joking. I know I know it's an exaggeration to make that kind of comparison. But literally hold your line. Uh, and Arsenal don't score in that moment. The Arsenal create the overload out wide, which was always going to happen in this game because that's the classic United goal. We concede overloads in wide areas, um, and and they score from the cutback. Like how many times <laughs> have we seen that this season? But it's only allowed oh, because Casemiro is like what four or five yards behind his own line. You know the defensive I, line, amazing. I I should guess I wondered if Mac- Mackie T might have played centre back. Just because we'd seen what happened when Casemiro does the other day, Juan Barlow was on but, the bench. I mean, maybe he wasn't fit enough for uh, for a whole game. Maybe. And Ten Hag, we know that he sort of is quite formulaic. With you get fit, then you get a bit of time, then you get a bit more time, and it, it, it builds. And it sort of sounds sensible. And then you look at how shit we are, and also how many injuries we get anyway. And then you kind of begin to wonder but what you said on the Arsenal defence is I think I mean it's sort of true that like they are a good defence and statistically they've conceded the fewest goals but when you actually look at the way that they do defend I mean they're not they don't feel to me like a great back four it's more that they're physical they know what they're doing and they get men around the ball if you've got that back four and Rice and I know Partey hasn't played most of the season and then Rice and Partey you're going to be hard to score against mm-hmm. but anyone 
never mind our bunch of dickheads. Mm. I mean, it does help so, them that they had uh, Saliba and uh, Gabriel. I think that was the thirty fifth game in a row they'd started, or something like that, or like consistency. And United have had about the same number of different combinations of, of centre backs this <laughs> yeah. season, so that clearly helps. I mean, they're clearly well drilled and coached defensively. They know what they're doing. They they get into the right positions very very quickly, and United created hardly anything as a result. Uh, not not a surprise. And to like, <laughs> I get. I guess I'd rather. I like. I'd rather be at this stage of the season complaining that United were really boring and couldn't create anything, but had ten more points and were fighting for a Champions League spate, spot than spending the entire season being completely open, trying to play transitional football, still only scoring fifty goals. Yeah, uh, like you can go down all the way down the table and look, and like Crystal Palace have scored more goals than us. I think Brentford in fifteenth have scored more goals than us. So, like, I, I tried. Like, we've had a few entertaining games this season where United scored quite a few goals, but it hasn't translated into a good football team that gets wins and scores points. So, I think I'd rather be complaining that we're boring but getting points <laughs> at this stage of the, the you know, the process towards becoming a team. There you go. Yeah, I I mean, I think I was before going on to this also something else I wanted to say, North London Forever, which they play at high at Arsenal before the game, but they played it on telly today, and it's got to be one of the most cringe worthy, vomitous footballing introductions I've ever seen, where some knobhead in a probably funny glasses and chinos with slip on shoes and no socks has been thinking, oh, yeah, we should have our, our You'll Never Walk Alone. And they've come by this North London forever cringe fest of disgrace, matched only by the commentary of Peter Drury, who I used to really enjoy. But he's now, since he got the Sky gig in particular, has sort of become, it feels like, all I could say is he watches the game with his willy out. Like, it feels like he's generally, like, on the edge through the whole game. Before, he says something like, you know, so Thin of resource and so needy of uplift. <laughs> and it sort of reminded me of something I have to say to my daughter sometimes when I say, listen, like, you don't need to be extra because you're enough. And I think that of Peter Drury, that when he's just being normal, just being Peter Drury, he's good because he's got a bit of vim and a bit of originality. But when you're trying to turn everything into a memorable phrase. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think I think so. Dick. It becomes a parody of himself, a bit like Roy Keane on Punditry, uh, where they're egging him on to say that's his job. Uh I, I, but I he bet... says it himself. Roy Keane understands the joke. Yeah, yeah. He said literally today, he goes, he they show the goal that he scores against Arsenal in the six one. And they're going, Oh yeah, lung busting run. He's going, Oh yeah, and a nice finish. But that was my job. And he laughs. Like, he un- he understands the joke. And people who dismiss Roy Keane, and we see this a lot, do so at their peril. Because it is true, there will be people on Twitter that understand the modern intricacies of the game and how training is taken these days and talked about in changing rooms and coaching and training pitches, probably understand the game in a different way to Roy Keane does. But that shouldn't be confused with thinking that Roy Keane doesn't know anything about football. What a ridiculous sentence that is. because. And I say this a lot, the fundamentals of the game remain the same. Mm-hmm. And Roy Keane understands them better than anyone on Twitter with a Y Scout login. Uh, I'm sure Drury, talking of him, enjoyed the biblical levels of rain that uh, hit Old Trafford with about five minutes to go in the game. Uh, I, I, the journalist, I mean, it's amazing that United, of all the things you can fix, the roof should be the easiest, but especially the roof over the press box. It happens every time it rains, right? That's where it leaks. And you get a thousand press people complaining about the roof at United. I mean, like the easiest PR fix and roof fix ever. Surely. Sort of find this, sort of find it weird though. Like you see people also talking about lack of Wi Fi in the press box. Like we're meant to care about this. And I am press. <laughs> it's just, yeah. 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 You've got this disgusting team <laughs> playing disgusting football and failing disgustingly. Why would anyone care about press box Wi-Fi? Uh, quite, yes. They would not. Just, and similarly, I want the roof at Old Trafford to be all right, but I find it ex- 
extremely hard to get agitated by that. And I understand that it's symbolic of the way the Glazers have looked after us or not looked after yeah. us. And people paying for tickets shouldn't get rained upon in that way. But it does not exercise me. <laughs> okay. Uh, on on NBC comms, John Champion, he is fine. I mean, he doesn't go over the top at all. Uh, said there was a chasm between the sides. Uh, United had more possession and more shots today. So there is, in terms of 30 points or something like that in the league, which is quite, quite... everything, <laughs> apart from... That game, yeah, other than that game, exactly. Uh, which was, yeah, surprisingly conservative from United, as I said, but also from Arsenal. They didn't take a lot of ch- chances today. And I guess that's what what they for them perfect result, isn't it? Score the goal, really weren't at risk of of losing it, except for you know a pot shot from somewhere or Garnacho, like managing to sneak one of his twenty seven runs through at one point. Um, so I'd, I'd expect they they think of that as job done. See, you have to go to Spurs in midweek. Uh, and then we're into the final game of the season. And, and it's not in their hands, Arsenal, but if City draw at Spurs, then City are going to have to make up three goals difference on the final day, which is a big ask. Just so. by the way, going back to the goal, because i just seen that, like Casemiro is getting all the blame for that, but one bissaka has got to be the, the footballer with the least game intelligence I think I've ever seen. I mean, there's, there's, there's some contenders there, but he's, yeah, yeah. Game intelligence is zero. Oh, no, no. But the way he just let Trossard run off him like that, yeah, as though there was no reason for him to investigate what was going on behind it's, him. It's not a but one-off I mean, I, I at all, is it? So. He's got a bit better at this. Like, he's not as li- he's not so, as much reliability at dead balls in particular and crosses. It was particularly with headers that was a problem. But... But to do, but to just allow someone to run off him like that, I was pleased. I say please, please is not the right word. But I mean, he was a right back, um, and I presume that was because of Saka. Yeah, that it was felt that he is a better one-on-one defender. I mean, in the end, Saka did nothing. But losing your man like that over your shoulder in the penalty box after your after the centre back has dropped a bollock is very, very poor behaviour. And yeah, I would. I'd get rid of him as soon as I could. <laughs> I mean, agreed. Uh, yeah, I'd get I'd get rid of uh, Wembeseka for sure. I think almost anything would be an upgrade there. I'd get rid of Casemiro, obviously. I mean, it's a like you always feel like you have to caveat it because what a fantastic career he has, but it's it's kind of embarrassing at this moment. Not entirely his fault when he's forced to play centre back, which he clearly doesn't know how to do. We saw on Monday against Palace that he doesn't know how to do this job. Uh, and, you know, defensive midfield, if he is that or was that, and centre-back are kind of symbiotic, aren't they? They have to play together. So it's not like completely divorced, but um, doing what he did for that opening goal. You can't even play tiredness, really, because it was like 15 minutes into the game. So, uh, And he's not played that many games either. Yeah, shocking behaviour, really. I, I'd, I'd bin him off. I just don't know that there's anyone who'll take it. He's still got two years on a massive contract. So, so um, I'm not even sure the Saudis I, I, would take him at this point, would they? So. When he was good, I said on Twitter, how the absolute fuck did United get Casemiro and not having Dion would be as good? And people keep been re- have been retweeted quite a lot the last week, <laughs> uh, as you might imagine. But actually, like this one I stand by, because when I said it, it was true. And I wasn't saying it about his ability to play centre-back. And I, I genuinely think that he was better for us last season than Dion would have been because we needed the goals. Um, I don't think he's a better player than Dion necessarily, and he definitely isn't now. But I think that we were better with him last season than we would have been otherwise. But yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's really time, isn't it? I don't know, know what happened to him that made it go like that. And I, I'm always loath when when it happens with older players to assume, oh, they just come for the money because you've, or whatever it is, because you've got people who have been trained to be focused athletes and they've been doing that two decades basically so it just feels disrespectful that and unlikely that they would suddenly think well fuck this but so i don't i don't know what's happened with Casemiro. I, don't, I don't think it's that i think but, it's physical it's just, yeah but i just I, I i think i think that too but sometimes it looks like the tackle against palace they're not getting up today you can you that feels a bit like a lack of application because 
if you're properly focused, you shouldn't do that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, he he's he was out of the Brazil squad. So is Anthony, unsurprisingly, <laughs> one goal all season. Uh, and Andres Pereira was in the Brazil, Brazil squad for the Copa America. Now, they only named 23 out of 26, so Casemiro could make it still. But, uh, man, talk, talk about sign of the times. United you know, like ruin players. Andres Pereira gets in the Brazil squad and Casemiro doesn't. <laughs> as soon as he leaves United. Perfect. Perfect, yeah. United have, United have now conceded 82 goals in all competitions this season. Wow. The most since 70-71. Yeah. I think, I think somewhere I saw someone tweet, if United lose the remaining games, uh, which is uh, quite possible, of course, uh, we will have lost more games than we did in the relegation season. So, And uh, I was looking through the data. The United's expected points... So based on the season's accumulation of expected goals for, goals against in each game, uh, puts uh, the team in the bottom five. So the, the players <laughs> have actually outperformed the system. Believe it or not. Well, that's it, isn't it? Yeah. It, no, 100% is individuals doing things, often towards the end of games, that has made this slightly less of a disaster than it might have been. Just <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> 50, 50. How many points we got? 50-something. 50 54, is it? Uh, and even like you look at the team today and you think, well, Ahmad's getting picked instead of Anthony. And Ahmad hasn't earned that, which means Anthony's getting dropped for being rubbish. Finally. And yeah. And then you think, well, why is it taking this long? And it felt like also it'd been made clear that Ahmad is not going to be a United player. But then you stick him in for this game. Why? Like, are you hoping that he'll do something? Why not? I hope, guess. Hope... Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, but I'm mad. He's an interesting know. player, isn't he? Because it, you know, in moments he's got nice feet, and uh, he, he took on players today, and he's good in tight spaces. Debatable whether he should have had a penalty for Partey getting a toe to the ball than cleaning him out afterwards. Um, interesting that wasn't discussed more really. He, he's all right. He's not very physical, but he's all right at shielding the ball in the right way. So he keeps it away from the defender to try and draw fouls. But there's not much else about his game. I don't see much of a cutting edge there. He's obviously not. He's fast, but not super fast. There's nothing really, really special. I, I'd be surprised if he makes it at United. And certainly under Ten Hag, he doesn't want that kind of player. So if Ten Hag stays, I can't see uh, Ahmad staying either. Um, I think those kind of technical players who retain possession just haven't been very good under Ten Hag, including Anthony, who Ten Hag wanted, and then played a completely different system. So. What What do you make of what... You won't have heard this, but Rooney was talking about Hoyland, and he was saying he thinks he's got something, thinks he's worth persevering with and a good player, and then went on to talk about how he misses chances and stuff. And to me, that's really not it with Hoyland. He's about it's, a goal doesn't... behind his XG, so that would that would say that's not true. Uh, I think I think honestly, I think ninety five percent of the problem with Hoyland is he's been asked to play a hold up number nine when he wants the ball in front of him. Yeah, you know, if he can get the ball in front of him and run, he's fantastic. The potential is great. Um, so I think he's just been used in the wrong system. It, it it means he doesn't get many chances and has to do too much of the thing things he doesn't like, and not enough of the things he's good at. And how does that how does that change without change of manager? It doesn't. It doesn't unless Ten Hag changes the system. So uh, and it's I mean hasn't done it all season. He found a plan B when there were injuries and he stuck with it, even though it was failing. Uh, yeah, I, I mean yeah. There, there's nothing about today's game that I'd want to bash Ten Hag over the head with. We've got a whole season for of stuff of evidence to bash Ten Hag. With today, today actually is quite a sensible approach against one of the two best teams in the country to be a bit more conservative, protect your back four, uh, and see whether you can create anything with individuals on the break. Like, given the situation, not a bad choice. But he could have played; he could have done that in so many games this season, and United would have got ten more points, and we would have been challenging. But then, if we're saying that what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get to an end point, and um, that involves a season of pain while the players learn what Ten Hag wants now that he's got more of the players that he wants in situ so that they can do it. Then you might say, okay. 
But again, I keep coming back to this. The endpoint looks also quite shit. Yeah, I, I mean, what is the endpoint? As we said, I, I feel like in a, in a way we're a broken record with him because it's the endpoint possession based football player. I actually he said no, right? He said he wants United to be the best transitional team in the world. He tried to set us up to be that, to create those transitional moments with the the high press. Uh, it didn't work. It hasn't worked. 14 defeats in the league. It hasn't worked. Um, and yet he persisted with it all season. And like that, that is the most damning thing. I don't think, I'm sure, look, he knows more about football, a thousand times more about football than I do. So clearly I'm just some fan who's voicing an opinion on the internet. I, I'm not trained to do this properly at all. But you lose this many games. Like simplistic analysis as it is, clearly not good enough. Clearly not good <laughs> enough. You know, so maybe it's not working. Maybe yeah, it's not working. That, that that feels like fair analysis. Yeah, and as I said, I think I'd rather be at this stage of the season complaining about how boring United are, uh, and like feel like there's some progress towards the end point. Like the the comparison with Arteta is made a lot, and I think unfairly because of the state of where Arsenal were completely awful before Arteta and where United were an absolute mess, but with a very expensive squad full of some talent. Um, and I see that uh, Arteta, I hate to say it because he's a twat, uh, but Arteta has made significantly more progress over that time than Ten Hag has managed to do with United. So that's where the comparison is fair. The progress has been better and it was towards a, an end goal and Arteta had these principles and he stuck with them all as he got the players and the system right. I mean, yeah, Arteta has pretty much been given a player that he likes in every position with some subs, which Tenas hasn't. If you look at what their first 11 is, look at who played today. He signed two goalkeepers, Riot and uh, Ramsdale. Even though he bet, probably felt he didn't even need to start the sign ride, but he just felt like there was an opportunity. He signed Ben White. He didn't sign Gabriel, I don't think, but he did sign Saliba. He signed Zinchenko. He signed Kieran Tierney, who played left back, and he's not using either of them. He's using Tommy Asu, who he also bought. Mm -hmm. He bought Partey. He bought uh, Rice. He bought Jorginho. He bought Odegaard. He bought Havertz. He bought uh, Jesus. He bought. Trossard when and that was Trossard was just immediately the player when they were surprisingly challenging for the title. That's that's a lot of players that he wants. So that's something that Tenas hasn't quite had. He has been supported to some extent in the market, but he hasn't he doesn't yet what have have that kind of hasn't had that kind of backing where it entirely his team and obviously the way the injuries have been were they've made it very much not his team because he's got players that, that he didn't buy who he probably doesn't want. So I, it's not so much about how crap this season has been that would mean I'd fire him. I, as I keep saying, I'd fire him because the what I see to be his end point is not something that I think will be successful. It feels like Ten, Ten Hag's best chance of keeping his job is because there aren't the alternatives that Ineos might want. And I think we come back to this all the time, like the, the view of Ashworth, Wilcox and Barada on, on what they want as the, the uh, play style game model uh, is more important than anything else. But then second comes, can they get in the man that they want to do that, to move it forward? And also, which of them is qualified to preside and judge game models? I mean, that's always the case when choosing a manager, isn't it? I mean, Ashworth's obviously been deeply involved with football, but more a structure and operations guy. Jason Walcott's interesting because he was head of development at City, had one year or less than a year, really, as technical director at Southampton in the championship, and now he's clearly moved up very quickly. Um, Barada, a long time at City, but in an operation, marketing and then an operations role. So, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And then Sir Jim, who's like no more qualified than we are, except he's got, you know, fuck tons more money. Uh, so. and, Ash and on Ashworth, instead, he's not exactly a football guy in that way. Who are Newcastle replacing him with? Yeah, Doug I don't Freeman. know. Are they? Who, Dougie who Freeman. Seen, okay. like yeah. who, who is a football man. Yeah. So he gives you that that structural whatever it is, perhaps, but also knows about football. I mean, he brought Elise and SA to Palace, for example, 
who feel like better players than most of those Ashworth selected for mm. Newcastle. Yeah, good point. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we had some more changes this week. Uh, Uncle Ralph turned down Bayern, amazingly so. And uh, it looks like they may be going with Hansi Flick for a year uh, and then uh, see if Alonso's available. If not, Klopp will have had his years, uh, years sabbatical and maybe he'd be interested in taking that job. Xavi is not leaving Barcelona. Uh, obviously, uh, Liverpool have hired Arnie Slot. Uh, I mean, and, and so, like, the open, the open, like managers are Southgate, who decides to leave England after the Euros. Potter, who apparently turned down the IX job. Who knows whether that's true or not? I mean, uh, ha- that I saw that and I just thought, fucking what? I mean, he might do well there, actually. He kind of feels like a setup for, for that kind of coach. But yeah. Who are you, Graham Potter? I mean, I don't know. Maybe there are reasons that he turned that down that we don't know. But the idea that Graham Potter would feel like he was too good to manage Ajax Amsterdam made me maybe he saw John Henderson there and wanted nothing to do with it, uh, or maybe, or maybe he thought, "Nah, I'm getting that United job." Oh God, yeah, dearie me, dearie me. I, I mean, I'd be less likely to do time if Potter got the job than Southgate. Southgate, I'd want to hurt someone. Yeah, so, not that I'm advocating violence. <laughs> You know, metaphorically. Is he new with the stick? God, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> too soon, too soon. Uh, yeah, comedy is tragedy plus time, isn't it? But uh, not yet, not enough time. Uh, yeah, and then Tuchel, who will be available, uh, and his people are telling uh, peeps in the press that he wants a job like on an hourly basis. Uh, <laughs> who, who, like, clearly... Is, clearly what, 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 what should you get for that? <laughs> what, what, I, got, I, got, I used to get £3 for baby soon. Did you? <laughs> yeah. That's quite good. <laughs> Plus all the food that I had. Uh, babysitters here in Seattle, by the way, basically earn uh, local minimum wages, which is, well, basically $20 an hour. Very expensive. Very expensive. Nice. Yeah, I feel like babysitting. You might earn more than I do right now. <laughs> I, well, I once had a situation with an employer where I worked like 10 minutes over an hour, so I billed for the next hour and was getting, why are you doing that? Give that to my babysitters. Yeah. If I come back literally a minute past an hour, I'd I pay up pay for an hour. Yeah. I'd pay up for an hour because that's what that's how you behave. You should have stayed as a lawyer, Dan. When The one time I had to use a lawyer for any length of time, she would call me and leave a voicemail and bill me 15 minutes for leaving that voicemail. <laughs> and it wasn't until I told to stop doing that because uh, I'd get several in a day. And I'd be like, where are all these billable hours coming from? Amazing. A friend of mine. A friend of mine that works in works in property, and he was asked by a mate of his some question about property or other. He gave the answer, and the bloke said, "Before you give me the answer, is is this like between mates for free?" And my mate was like, what the "Are you talking about? Of course, we're mates." And relayed the story about a third person we know. He's an architect. He'd asked him a question, and the guy goes, "I'm telling the answer, but if I did, I'd have to bill you." Wow, I know. <laughs> What, what are Incredible life, eh? scenes. Incredible scenes. Yeah. Uh, for, the footballers don't get, don't charge by the hour. Um, but, <laughs> but like they've been stealing a living for this season, for sure. Uh, Anthony Martial was in training this week. Do you think he's going to be fit for the cup final? Talking about someone stealing a living. Be absolutely amazing C. scenes, wouldn't it, for him to come back? Does well against C. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he gets five uh-huh. minutes to the end, enough time for him to get injured again. Just so we can't sell him. <laughs> well, he's out contract, so we don't have to. One of the oh. few we'd have to bin off for a fee. Yeah. In some ways, he is the wastrelliest of the wastrels because he could have been a player. Could have been. Could have been. His body and his, uh, I don't know, mentality around injuries held him back for sure. So, so you, so you Dan, non football man coming in, you're, you're the next director of football. How do you deal with, let's say your transfer budget is something like a hundred million. So looking at yeah, it's, yeah. So let's say it's something like that. Plus what if you can sell? What are you doing? I guess the first thing I do is I buy a midfielder because I think that's the most important one. And then the second thing I do is buy another midfielder because I can't tolerate a situation where one injury brings us back to this. So I guess I'm probably looking to spend whatever I need to spend to get the one I really want. 
then assuming there's no one I think who I can promote who will be able to fill in, then I'm going to have to try and buy someone, someone on the cheap who I think, who I think will be good. After that, we need to send the back. What I'm really hoping will happen, and I'm not really hoping this will happen, but also I'm really hoping it will happen is we get off the profit money for Ashford, because if we get that, then that is a very significant chunk of the rebuild. Um, yeah, I think that's fairly unlikely given the size of his wages. So it, it puts him into a category of player that only a few clubs, very few right, clubs. And, and, and right, and I, and it's only because the only reason I've even raised this possibility is because Paris got to replace Mbappe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they didn't, I'd be abs- I wouldn't even be raising it because I know that we were stuck with him. It's only because there might be a one-time only deal. The circumstances just might work out. I don't know. If not, then... I guess we, we get rid of Varane, I suppose. He's out of contract, isn't he? So He's get, out of contract. You know, his wages. I'm taking whatever I can get for one Bissaka, 5 million, 10 million quid, if that's what it is. I'm selling, um, well, I'm selling almost everyone if I can, but that's unrealistic. I, you've, Casemiro, hopefully there's, a, hopefully there's a deal for him in Saudi. Yeah, I mean, it would be a freebie, I think. I don't think United are getting a fee. I mean, at this point, his performances are so bad, we're going to have to get him to tweet something against the regime for them to take him. Uh, <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, just while we're talking about that, I don't know whether anyone follows the Newcastle United supporters against sports watching account. But they post some absolutely horrendous stuff about you know what their owners are doing. Um, and uh, the amount of people who are literally in prison for decades for tweeting something or whose village has been bulldozed to make way for the Neom, which is this, uh, or part of it is that ridiculous, like kilometers long silver line in the sand, um, uh, all, all state funded projects. Um, and uh, yeah, horrendous. This is what uh, uh, the football governance bill does not rule out, by the way, uh, owners of that nature. But, uh, that's an aside. I, and, and it is completely hypocritical of us to go, hey, and I hope this sports watching project of the Saudi Pro League uh, can take uh, Casemiro off our hands too or take some of that sweet, sweet cash. Um, but this is the complexities of um, of sport in the 2024, isn't it? Yeah. So I guess we're selling him if we can. I mean, there's almost no one I wouldn't sell. It's like, I'd sell Luke Jaw if I could because he never fucking plays. I mean, yeah. I mean, there won't be a fee for him either. He's a brilliant player. But massive risk, so uh, I think that's very hard to do. Malaysia, uh, yeah. we don't know knee injury plus complications. Is he going? We're not come back it. good. He's not. He's not going to get sold. We're not. We're not, we're not selling it. But they're well left back. Surely they can't be in a situation where they have no left back. Casemir. Then there's Maguire and Lindelof. Get rid of both of them if, if I could. Both with a year left on their contracts. Yeah, so not much. But there's got to be thirty million quid there. Ish. Yeah. Ahmad to these three, got to be another 10 million. Yeah. Jaden Sancho and, and Greenwood are the two big hopes, I guess. Of, uh, I mean, it's uh, Greenwood's an interesting one. I, I, I think we spoke about him last week, didn't we? His, imp- his performances have improved throughout the season, for sure. Playing in a position I think is not really his natural one, sort of wide right in a 4 4 2. And like he's got to have been good enough to have piqued some interest in him. I mean, the thing with Sancho is how many good games has he actually had? Uh, not many. He wasn't even, he wasn't good in the second. We'll do the Champions League in bonus content, but he didn't play well in the second leg. Didn't do anything. Um, but yeah, I feel like Dortmund would take him and it won't be for loads of money, but whatever it is, it'd probably be something that we'd say yes to, right? Yeah, I mean, it. it, it given, I mean, they are making the Champions League Dortmund, aren't they? Uh, and could even win this year's Champions League final, of course. Uh, and, but their uh, their budget is like constrained. It looks like they're going to do the deal for Ian Matson, which is 35 million. That's the release clause, Euros. Good deal. Um, and it was, yeah, interesting for uh, Chelsea's third left back, I guess. Um, but uh, Sancho, who knows whether they've got any money left. But if they If they want to do a loan deal again, I'm sure United would be right to ask for more money 
this time because well his, they'll get the wages paid right but they've got to get the wages paid but they didn't this time you're not fully and yeah i'd have an extra bonus and it might work out okay because the extra bonus for making the champions league final or whatever it was um but the impairment charge on the ffp or the ffp charge or psr charge plus his wages is like 30 million pounds right so that is really what you want to do to not come out as a loss um and, and that seems unlikely uh, so you know in a in a sense taking any fee as long as it's above the ffp charge is good so let's say let's say we sell Ahmad to these three, 10 million quid. Greenwood, 10 million quid, 20 million quid. Sancho, 10 million quid, 30 million quid. Maguire, 10 million quid, 40 million quid. No, that's 50, um, 50 million quid. Lindelof, 10 million quid. We're talking like very, like the bottom level of, of what we would expect to get for those guys. And that's 60 million pounds still. So if the budget's 100 million, and we generate sixty million, and that's just sales. Forget about wages for a second, and that forget. And then you add to that Varane's wages, and there are probably Martial's wages. Suddenly, that feels like another two or three players. Yeah, and it's releasing. But it is my, releasing a lot of budget for sure. Here's my here's my worry with Ineos. Actually, part of me thinks: Do I trust these? To do they understand that? In order to be good, you have to, like, as in properly, properly good, what it takes. Because if you think about what's going on at the moment in, in English football, but also in the game more generally, so you might be able to find players for 30 million quid who are good, or 20 million quid who are good. But the teams that win the big pots, look at Manchester City, look at Liverpool when they did it, look at Real Madrid, have a few proper proper superstars, players who are among the best in the world. When Liverpool won the league, they had Salah, they had Mane, they had um, Alisson, they had Van Dijk. One of the reasons I think, and I've actually written about this just now, one of the reasons I think that Arsenal aren't going to win the league is because they don't have that. There have been five games in the league this season Arsenal have scored no goals. City have only had three. And Arsenal also went out the FA Cup to Liverpool, no goals. Out the Champions League to Bayern Munich, no goals in the away games. And the way I see it, Arteta's got the defence sorted. But how many elite level attackers does he have? And even if you say that Saka is that, and even if you say that Odegaard is that, look who City have got in that mm. position, and look who they've got behind them. Yeah, for sure. The depth is Where, much, much greater. Yeah. And so we could go and be like, well, I can't even remember some of the names I've seen linked, but you might say such and such there is 20 million quid, and that's good value. And that might be the case that for 20 million quid, such and such a player, Who's available? So what's his name? Um, Adarab uh, Tosin at Fulham, right? Who um, Muppeteers, who is always feels to me to be exceptionally sourced. Yep, I've absolutely no idea where he's getting it from, but respect to where he's getting it from because almost everything of that ilk that we hear from him, we hear from him before everyone else, and it then appears to be accurate. Yeah, I, didn't yeah. know, I didn't even know who Tyrone Lassie was. I literally never heard of him until I heard him say that we were going to buy him, and a few later we do so. Let's, I feel like he's someone we can generally take at face value. And I'm not saying Tosin isn't good enough to play for United. I'm saying that the opportunity of adding him might be a good one, as in you get him to nothing because I think he's out of contract. He is, so, yeah. Well, well, that's good. But then the next question is, is that good enough? Yeah. yeah. And as a third choice, might be good enough. Yeah, yeah. We, fourth we, choice. We can roll uh, as a, a fourth choice, potentially. And and, uh, might, and maybe maybe, maybe they do the deal with the the, the sister club now for Tadebo. Um, um, as long as they have a fair market value for him, of course. Uh, right. And uh, again, I, I don't know. I don't know how good Todd is. Todd, is Tadebo or Todibo? I don't know. How, however good that guy is. Let's say the first question can't be, is he value for money? It has to be, is he good enough? Co correct. Absolutely. But, and, but two, the two always go hand in hand nowadays, don't but they? No, so. Sometimes. Sometimes. Because Liverpool, Liverpool managed to do it on a budget. Until they got to the end and they thought, then they then had to say, okay, well, what does this team need? And the answer was one of the most, if not the most expensive centre back ever, and one of the most, if not the most expensive goalkeeper ever. And then they went and did it. And actually, that's where Arsenal are now. They need to do finishing touches, need to do the other end of the pitch. Yep. They need to say, who are the, where's the 
they're the best striker in left wing, yeah, yeah. I think, that we, that, that we can get. And they just go and do that. And they probably will because their FFP position is quite healthy. And they've just signed that new front shirt sponsorship deal with Emirates, which is uh, as large as the one with Qualcomm and United. And with, with United, it's all very... It's, we could say, well, in, maybe we've already signed those players. But we have them. Maybe those players are Mayu, Garnacho, Hoyland. But they're not there yet. But I would say the idea isn't to go and sign your Allison and your Van Dykes of this world who are already there. The point is when you go and sign someone for 20 million quid, then be, or 30 million quid, whatever it is, then you've got to answer two questions. One is, do I think this player is going to be a first teamer or a squad player? And if the answer to the, fir- if the, answer to the first question is a first team, the next question is, do I think they have potential to be one of the best in the world? And you don't need to answer yes to that in every position, but the anchor midfield, for example, to me, the answer to that has to be yes. The right-sided centre-back, the answer to that has to be yes. And I also think probably almost the same applies to the fullbacks, because the, the fullbacks are so important in the modern game, and it's almost like I feel like we're learning that by watching us try and do it without them. Yeah. And I can't remember who it was who said this, I think it was one of the Dutch managers that the first thing that you do is you buy a left back because that is the hardest position to fill on the pitch because there's a few of them. And that, that left footed left back is how you open up the pitch and the angles. And I mean, I know Tenaf is particularly into that as well, but it's, it's not just signing players who are good value. It's signing players who are good value with ceilings that are where they need to be. And then it becomes. Partly up to the player. Does the player want it enough? Are they lucky with injuries? Is everything all right at home? Whatever that, whatever it might be. But do they have the potential to get to there? And for some, it might be okay to say no. Like if you go and sign another study for the Sandro Martinez, and you think that Martinez is going to come back from injury and be as fit and as good as he was before, then yeah, you don't doesn't need to be one of the best. It needs to be someone who would do the job. But the big signings of this summer. That would be the midfield, the, the midfield anchor, the right side and centre back, and the full backs. This is what I would do. Um, if you're not, if you don't have the potential to be superb, then then we're just going to end up with these similar cycles where players who might be able to go somewhere else and be good are going to come to us, be not good enough, and we're still going to be crap. Yeah, and and the one thing I say about Ten Hag to round it off uh, with the manager is that he is quite tolerant of very mediocre players and uh, yeah, sh- shockingly so uh, ha- happy to have Vakehorst, Amrabat, uh, Anthony uh, in Amrabat, his team though, I uh, got one of the worst signings of all time who we haven't even signed it's it, it's hey, quite don't, an amazing don't take maybe we spun car you know we've already got a, a, a an option for what is it another 20 something million euros to sign him full time uh, surely not surely not and anyway look all of that is um i think i think it's good preface to say it's a very tough job for united this summer you know both with the likelihood of no european football or increasing likelihood of no european football which impacts which is the budget semi good yeah. Also, it means you could be. Like, we're not going to be conf- spending every night Thursday night conferring. <laughs> no, that's right. We're going to be doing a lot of mailbag pods next season to fill the fill space <laughs> oh, in <man>. midweek. <laughs> so yeah, so like it, if there is no European football, they can definitely plan for next season with a smaller squad and or a, you know a few youth players filling out the squad. I think. I mean, clearly, and and it would be sensible to do that if there is Conference League football. The maximum United can make out of that is like thirty or forty million. <laughs> Uh, if there's Europa League football, you can actually make decent money now because the pot's got a much bigger, nowhere near the Champions League, um, but it's about a third and it's uh, distributed a bit more equally. Yeah. So, in that context, what, what we're saying, it also kind of seems even stranger that, in a sense, that unless we sell really well, that we harbour a serious interest in Michael Elise, who has, I think is a lovely footballer, but right wing is not where I'm starting trying to improve this disgrace. Uh, no, I, I agree. I agree. I, I do both on both points. He's a lovely footballer with a, you know incre- incredible potential and ceiling. Uh, he's very, very dynamic. He does uh, a lot of what Anthony does, but adds goals and assists uh, and takes players on. 
um, and, so, pace. And, and pace and bit pace and pace, bit more pace. And, and uh, but it feels like where United are right now. There should, be a, there should be a season for signing for 2025 rather than 2024 because there are other priorities. Um, but maybe they think they can do the deal a re- reasonable amount. Apparently, the 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 uh, uh, who was it? It may have been James uh, and Muppeteers saying that the release clause is less than the 60 million. So, but he'll That's have other, other clubs it... interested in him and probably better options than United. But even if it's fifty, that's a lot of that's a lot of the budget unless you sell really well that yeah. needs to go in the on in on the spine of the team, I think. All right, let's round it out there. Uh, congratulations <laughs> to United that. Women. Congratulations to United Women on a fantastic FA Cup win. Uh yeah, difficult season, crowned off um by lifting the trophy at Wembley. Let's hope the men are able to do that in a couple of weeks' time as well. Can't say I'm very confident, uh, but all right. Well, that, uh, that is another thing about. Sorry, just uh, what we've just seen is that as this keeps going on, there are fewer and fewer games for us to get any momentum. There will be the none. final none. and get the injured player. We get the injured players back. I mean, yeah. we forgot to say this, but it's tremendous the amounts injured again. <laughs> yeah, 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 just but yeah. yeah. I thought that we were told quite recently that Shaw was on the verge of a comeback. I guess. I think from what he said, we can assume that Rashford and Bruno will get at least one game in before the cup final. But if we can't get Shaw and Martinez back in, then it feels it's, like it's pretty risky to throw them into the cup final. Afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Half fit players versus crap players. That's a it's a trade off there. All right, uh, for backers, we're going to talk about uh, the Champions League semi finals and then the final to come. And um, I. I think we might have the tactics pod back as well for backers um, uh, on Monday. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye now. Please.